And if you want to see the site of the temple, or where the third temple is going to be built, uh, it is in Jerusalem, uh, on what is now the site of the Dome of the Rock, or the great Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Mosque of the Faraway Place. That's a whole other idea. When Titus destroyed that temple in 70 AD, he did something that changed the history and the mindset of those people drastically because for them, the temple was God's dwelling place. And now with that massive temple rebuild, the people who were left in Jerusalem would walk by its ruins and say, where is God now? Where does God live? What are we going to do without our temple? And the answer to that question of where is God now is really significant because what we see is that the people's dependence on the temple was far too powerful. They never should have had the notion that God lived in the temple rather than somewhere else. At some point, there had been a massive shift from the idea that God lives with us in our daily lives. And now God lives in a temple, some place where we go to experience his presence on special occasions. Abraham encountered God directly when he sat and ate bread with Melchizedek, the high priest of El Elyon, who was the high God of the gods of the heavens. And Enoch walked with God as a friend. And David in the 23rd Psalm said, God is with me wherever I go, by the green pastures and the still waters and in the valley of the shadow of death. And where is God's house? I will live in God's house forever. It is here with me. And Isaiah who said, God lives in the hearts of humble people. They understood God as living in us. There was a shift whereby God went to live somewhere else. And the greatest part of the shift happened because a king of Israel called Josiah decided that he would make the temple the singular dwelling place of God around 649 BC. And to do that, he sent soldiers out to destroy all the other temples particularly the temple in Bethel and the temple in Samaria and all the other temples. And he said, no, God is not out there. God dwells in one place, in this temple, in Jerusalem, and nowhere else. You can see what happened there is that people who had a controlling and an obsessive, compulsive desire to organize things did away with all the free expression and all of the personal relationship with God and made God a centralized figure in the temple. And that was very damaging. So in a real sense, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, something really good happened to our religious expression and it was the destruction of the temple which made the birth of Christianity a possibility. And all the writers of the New Testament were writing in the context of people saying, the temple is gone, now what are we going to do? The New Testament writers said, look, don't worry about it. And they developed this new idea that said, God is with you, God is close to you, God is eternal, God is with us. And of course, the term God with us in the Hebrew is Emmanuel, which is Jesus. And so all the stories of Jesus are designed to answer the question, where is God? And the answer, God is with you. We look closely at the New Testament writings, we find wonderful testimony to the fact that there was a group of people who were ready to carry on the religion, even without that wonderful temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-21, the Apostle Paul says to us, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we interpret those words in weird ways that it's something to do with, with purity and, and, and looking after your body. 
In a sense, it is that, but in another sense, Paul is simply answering the question, we don't have a temple, what are we going to do? Paul says, your body is the temple. And when Paul said body, he wasn't using the word for the physical body, the sarche, or the flesh. He used the word for the substance, your substance, your being, your mind, your spirit. That's where God lives. And that is the temple. In the two opening hymns that we had today, we had that term and phrase, you are a temple. God, come and live within my spirit. The Apostle Paul talked like that. In 1 Peter 2 and 5, there are verses that are very encouraging to us, where Peter says to the people, allow yourselves to be living stones. And he was referring literally to the fact that the stones that formed the temple had been taken away. And if we don't have a building of stones, what are we going to do? And Peter says, you, let yourselves be living stones in the building of a new temple, which shall be God's dwelling place. And the cornerstone, which was rejected by the builders, has become the most important stone of all. Christ shall be the cornerstone of the new temple, and you will be the living stones which build up its walls and create a dwelling place for the God of the heavens. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, the Apostle Paul again says, allow yourselves to be living sacrifices. And that's because the main thing that the people did in the temple was to make a sacrifice whereby they would gain forgiveness. But now they have no temple, no place to make the sacrifice. What do we do? Paul says, you are a sacrifice. Be a living sacrifice in the way that you live your life with grace and goodness and kindness and mercy. And in all the stories of Jesus, we have this idea of Jesus' people as a living temple, emphasized and expanded. The people say to Jesus, what should we do? And in all those beautiful stories, Jesus says, live with compassion, live with tenderness, live with mercy, live with kindness. And you are the temple. God is within you, and God's Spirit dwells in you, and you won't even miss that physical structure. Other stories about Jesus enhance this idea in the story of the cleansing of the temple. And remember, the story is being written after the temple has been destroyed. Jesus goes in and says the temple has lost its purpose anyway, so do not mourn that it is gone. And probably the most telling and most powerful story of Jesus that explains to us where we are going to encounter God is the story in the fourth chapter of John when Jesus meets the woman at the well in Samaria and she wants to argue with him about where God lives. And you remember that back in 649 BC, Josiah went out and destroyed the temple of the Samaritans. So now the Samaritan woman says to Jesus, you Jews say that we worship God in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans say that we worship God on this mountain. Who is right, Jesus? And Jesus answers her with those words that we so love. And now we understand the power behind them. He said to her, the time is coming when we shall not worship God in Jerusalem or on this mountain. The hour is coming and is now when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. See the power of those words being heard by a people who no longer have a temple to go to? Where will we worship God? In spirit and in truth. 